schedule and would like to be back at his office tomorrow, which means he and Dr. Carter are going to have to be out of here about 5.30. We will have a short reception afterwards, so you'll have a chance to visit with him. I promise that unlike last week, he will wrap up about on time, so there really will be a half hour or so to talk with him individually. For those of you who don't know, I'm Eric Kelly. I'm chair of the Department of Urban Planning. We are absolutely delighted today to host Peter Clark, who is currently director of planning and then manager of plan community planning and development in Denver. He was previously in Milwaukee, where he worked for Mayor Norquist, whom some of you have heard speak when he was in um, Indianapolis. He has recently been working on the Blueprint Denver plan, which is a lot of what he's going to talk about today. Peter Park holds a Bachelor of Science in Architectural Studies from Arizona State and earned both architecture and planning degrees at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where he also taught. He's currently an adjunct associate professor of urban design at the University of Colorado at Denver, where I started teaching, so I'm very fond of that institution. We're very fortunate to have him here today. This is one of his easier guest lectures. He's also been a guest lecturer at the University of Chicago, Harvard Graduate School of Design, Marquette University, University of Montreal, and the University of Tokyo, which was a lot longer trip than we had today. So we are just delighted to have Peter Park with us. I do want to make one short presentation, which we'll do at the beginning since he's going to have to dash out at the end. We want you to remember us by something other than a hectic day, so we will send you home a, a real souvenir of Ball State. Peter Park. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, uh, and thank you all. I've, I have had a great day. Uh, got to see a little bit of Muncie and uh, meet with some students as well. And uh, so I'm very happy to be here. I, I have a lot of slides to show, and I promise I'll try to get through them as quickly as possible. There are just so many things that um, I heard today of what faculty and students are thinking about uh, in terms of planning. And so um, I'm going to try to share as much as I can. It's, there's a whole bunch of PowerPoint slides. It might actually look a little bit like a movie uh, as fast as it might be going. So um, uh, let's, just, let's just get started. I'm going to talk about um, Blueprint Denver, uh, really implementing Blueprint Denver, but give you a little bit of background of what that plan is about, which was actually done before I got to Denver. Um, but let me give you a little bit of introduction. I was planning director in Milwaukee in a place that was on Lake Michigan and uh, plenty of water. Uh, I'm now in Denver, a place with big mountains, but very little water, unfortunately. Much of the work in Milwaukee was a lot of post-industrial city, a lot about reweaving urban fabric, uh, putting the city back together again, in fact. And in Denver, uh, we have much of that, of course, but it's also a city that is growing uh, and an enormous amount of land that is underdeveloped or never developed. So a lot of it is weaving new urban fabric. Both cities have wonderful legacies in terms of architecture, uh, great buildings, but also a great uh, history of public space. Olmsted um, uh, was part of uh, Milwaukee's legacy, John Nolan. A number of others commented on the design and the overall structure of Milwaukee. In Denver, Mayor Robert Speer went to the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago, was inspired and brought uh, the, the City Beautiful movement to this uh, high uh, desert uh, in, in order to try to make, um, I think, maybe an oasis in a place that uh, trees don't seem to want to grow all that much. Um, but both cities have wonderful, great neighborhoods, great urban legacies um, that today uh, I now in Denver have the opportunity to um, build upon. Let me give you a little bit of background about what Blueprint Denver is, and then I'm also going to be interspersing some other thoughts, uh, sometimes from Milwaukee. So. Uh, if you'll indulge me, I'll make a few uh, brief uh, detours, but we'll come back. Fundamentally, though, Blueprint Denver is a plan that recognizes that Denver is growing um, and has grown significantly. In the 90s, Denver grew by almost 90,000 people, and by 2020, we'll see under 132,000 people in the city alone, nearly a million, two million, three in our region. Uh, right now, there are about just around 600, just under 600,000 people in the city of Denver, maybe about two and a half million in the region. So we're going to we're going to see some significant growth, and this this growth, I think, uh, it's as rapid as it was, and the amount of change that it created, I think, created a lot of pain for people 
Um, and so perhaps I think that might have been one of the most significant drivers of creating the plan. And density is an important word because oftentimes in the American context, we think about density in an evil way. You know, it's, ooh, it's just scary. Uh, all those bad things that happen when you have density. But the reality is this, gender's boundaries are fixed. Growth is gonna happen. It's going to become more dense. So we need to find ways of encouraging density in the right way, of managing that growth and change in ways that link land use to transportation, help to create population and activities that support all forms of transit use, and stimulates and channels growth to new neighborhoods. What Blueprint Denver does, the most fundamental thing it does is it organizes the city into areas of stability and areas of change in a very simple sort of first cut. And I think it's a very reasonable way of thinking about planning. And this occurs in every city, no matter if it's growing or in decline. But it's a very useful way of thinking about it. So areas of stability, for example, comprise most of the city, right? Primarily strong uh, existing residential neighbors where there will be some change, but not dramatic change. And the goal here is to really enhance the character and preserve the character of what's already there. In terms of areas of change, those are places where development or redevelopment can be most beneficial. And uh, so the purpose of areas of change is to identify and to broadcast, this is where we want to see the development happen. This is where we want the change to happen. And we need to find ways to channel growth to those areas. In terms of growth, there are three types of, of development that are contemplated in areas of change. The reuse and redevelopment of land, the creation of new neighborhoods, and transit centers. So for example, there are a number of industrial areas, uh, land that uh, really isn't used as much as it was uh, at one point in Denver's history, and many buildings that uh, have the opportunity to see their next life and next use. New neighborhoods, Stapleton, the redevelopment of Stapleton Airport or Lowry Air Force Base, I think are pretty well known examples of creating entirely new places, entirely new neighborhoods uh, on, um, and reusing land. And you can see Stapleton in the foreground here, which extends the pattern of streets and blocks, uh, mix of uses, mix of housing types in the way that many of Denver's other historic neighborhoods, Washington Park and Congress Park were organized. Obviously, uh, the trees are already in place <laughs> in the existing older neighborhoods, and they'll take some time for them to mature in Stapleton, but there's a rather aggressive uh, pattern of infrastructure and, and street trees um, as part of Stapleton's design. And then transit centers. We have a significant investment in transit in and around Denver, and those are the places where we want to see some of this growth occur. Another thing that Blueprint Denver does is it identifies three primary implementation strategies. Planning is one thing, and that's great. Implementation is, is really the important part, right? Because planning is a process of collecting our community vision of where do we want to be as a community. But unless we commit to implementation, unless we identify and create plans that are clearly implementable, it's sort of a nice conversation, right? That we need to remember that there, are, we need to make sure that we have a very clear idea of how we implement. So I think Blueprint Denver does a nice job. It basically identifies these three things. Public infrastructure, partnerships, and land use regulation. Oftentimes when plans are done, the assumption is now we can implement the plan by changing all the zoning. To a degree, we can do that, but that in itself doesn't implement plans for us. We need to make sure that plans also affect decisions about prioritization of capital uh, for public infrastructure, uh, and also look for opportunities, especially in these days. We've been faced with some very difficult economic times in Denver uh, and budget reductions that uh, have been really, really quite a challenge. Um, and so we need to continuously look for opportunities for partnership, uh, not just among public and private entities, but across uh, uh, other jurisdictional lines. So why is Blueprint Denver important? As someone coming to Denver uh, who didn't uh, participate in the creation of the plan, um, I think it's really an amazing thing for a city of Denver's size. And I think that uh, because there's a number of people, hundreds or thousands of people that contributed to making this plan. So I think it's important because it does represent a collective vision of the people of Denver I think what's particularly appealing to me is that it promotes the preservation and the creation of 
urban patterns. Urban patterns are diverse land use, multimodal streets, and unique places. So here's sort of a vision of sprawl, I would consider, right? Vision of sprawl in that, you know, it's interesting, we often criticize urban sprawl as being unplanned. But the reality is, sprawl is absolutely planned. It absolutely is. This development follows probably every regulatory standard that exists in this community. I have no idea where it is, but it kind of doesn't matter, does it? Right? And, and that's the challenge because, you know, what, it, it, it's perfect, right? There, the, the, you shop here, there are two family units here, there are single family housing here, um, and there are enormously large roads in between everything, right? That's the plan. That's what zoning provided. It fits. But ultimately, and unfortunately, um, I think more and more we find that it may not be the most sustainable way of making our communities. Today, uh, the image on the left, you can build that all day long. Probably there are more communities right now, uh, planners reviewing projects that will produce that than will produce the image on the right. It's easier to do the development on the left with regard to making a residential development than creating uh, the neighborhood that you see on the right. With regard to commercial, all day long, there are lending institutions financing development that will look like this. There are zoning rules that will create that, uh, and there are planning boards and staff that will review and permit it. Uh, but to create a main street like this is enormously difficult. And it seems a little crazy, but that's sort of the state of our regulatory and lending financial practices in the United States right now, more than anything else. So the ones on the right, if you like those images on the right, um, well, you're just going to have a lot more work to do in order to get there. So the vision of Blueprint, as I mentioned earlier, is a fundamentally urban perspective. Uh, urban in terms of identifying land use and transportation diversity, valuing the existing patterns uh, in the context of the existing city and the history of the city, the importance of the public realm of streets and blocks and squares, the importance of recognizing the, there are public aspects of private building that need to be attended to in order to make great cities, a focus on placemaking, a focus on pedestrian friendly and being able to walk about as well as drive, as well as take transit, and an opportunity of transit-oriented development. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. There are four uh, parts of implementing Blueprint that I, I'm gonna cover briefly today. One is a strategic transportation plan. The second is to talk about our transit-oriented development uh, efforts um, relative to fast tracks, a uh, referendum measure that was passed almost a year and a half ago, um, uh, and improvements to our permit process and update of our zoning code. Now, as I understand it, the uh, theme of the lecture series uh, this semester is emerging synthesis. So as much as possible, what I'm gonna try to do is to emphasize to you that in terms of synthesis, there's a whole range of things happening in the planning field today that in fact demand that synthesis. Synthesis, for example, of transportation and land use controls being looked at simultaneously. Synthesis of city staff across departments who need to work together more closely and in more coordinated ways to enhance and improve the permitting processes, which um, oftentimes can go too slow. And Synthesis between the kind of regulations that we use to guide development and our aspirations or plans um, uh, that we write. So first to the strategic transportation plan. This follows up from Blueprint Denver, uh, and it's, a, it's an overall look at the city in terms of the system of transportation. And I like to talk about it in terms of, you know, when we design streets or we establish street standards, I think what we should do is just start with a form. Like, what is the place that we want to make? What kind of places do we desire? Is it a main street environment like on the left or a residential boulevard uh, on the right? Let's start with that and then we can talk about calibrating the street rather than calibrating the street based on how many cars we expect to go past this point per hour per day, right? That the criteria for design and evaluating our decisions and our policies need to start with what do we want? and understanding very fully that the relationship between the buildings and the uses and the width of the street and the elements within the street is a very important one. And this is where engineers come together with planners and landscape architects and architects, okay? 
Everybody has their realm of responsibility, but it all has to come together in one common place. So in terms of our transportation challenges, um, the committed improvements through 2015 will maintain our mobility levels in Denver with some con congestion. But um, with the, if we look out further, 2030, we don't meet any of our mobility needs under the current assumptions. So this counts lane miles, for example, and sort of proves out the increase in congestion that we can experience um, by 2030. Kind of doesn't matter what the exact numbers are. You just know that it's an upward uh, trend. Um, sorry about that. I don't know what that was. Um, and so one way we're looking at it is we need to look beyond the cars. Okay? So we're looking at the major components of the roadway network, our transit network, a bi bicycle network, pedestrian network, a whole number of things like this. Because what we're doing actually is talking about person trips. We're not counting just the cars. We're talking about person trips. And this is really a challenge, by the way, but, and it's unconventional. But we think it's absolutely important to recognize that mobility, when we talk about mobility, isn't, it isn't assuming that everyone can drive or is gonna be driven, right? We have transit, we have light rail, we have bicycles. We have a number of ways in which people might move around. So the intention here is, is to actually factor in density, land use, availability of other transit, and identify what we're calling travel sheds. It's almost like stormwater, okay? Where are the sources where a lot of stormwater will collect and how do you move it through? But it's beyond counting the cars, and it's actually trying to collect a lot of other data about density and use um, and uh, identify these areas where origin destination points exist. Second thing is fast tracks and transit oriented development. Fast tracks is a nearly $5 billion referendum that was passed, four cents on a $10 purchase, um, that helps to finance an extension of the existing light rail system uh, by nearly 120 miles, uh, adding a whole number of stations throughout the region, extension of light rail, bus rapid transit, and commuter rail connections out to the airport, connections out to Boulder and the surrounding communities. Now this is Denver's Union Station. Actually, yeah, well, not quite like that anymore. Um, that one burned down. Um, but I, I show this slide at the top because you can see uh, all the rail yard the, on the other side of the station. And you can see how the significant uh, uh, function that this Union Station played in attracting growth and wealth and people to Denver. And as we look out from the station here, you can see how this is absolutely, from the very beginning, transit-oriented development. It is what grew the city in the first place. Rail has, has been a significant shaper of Denver. And you can see significant amount of growth that's happened uh, <laughs> as part of that, but not necessarily around transit. And now we have the ability to change that, though. So here you can see the station right at the bottom. It's still there, luckily, and an enormous amount of land in the, in the Platte River Valley uh, that we have this incredible opportunity. All the tracks have been removed now, the land remediated. And so just around the central hub of the regional transit system where light rail, commuter rail, passenger rail, the ski train, but you know, all these things will converge on this place. Uh, we have near Lodo, uh, a lot of land for new development in downtown. It's probably the most sustainable thing that we can think about doing is encouraging higher density uses. And what you see here is a fundamental, and this isn't exactly how it'll be built, of course, but there's a fundamental perspective of organizing it into fine grain scale streets and blocks and public spaces that provide linkages uh, to amenities such as the Riverfront Park and the Commons uh, and a num number of other amenities um, uh, in the rest of downtown. So I really like to think about and get you to think about this in terms of investment. You know, we talk about highway spending, right? We need to think about our, our tax money, our federal tax money particularly, as investment. This is the Marquette Interchange in, in Milwaukee. It's phenomenal. This is, you could just stare at that all day. Um, trying to figure out 
where could all of these roads go? Somehow they make sense, I'm not sure. Um, but the thing about it is, when we see facilities like this that need to get replaced or expanded, it costs a lot of money, a whole lot of money. And fundamentally, what I've always been puzzled by is these elevated freeways that move through downtowns, move through high quality real estate in ways that take billions of our taxpayer dollars to devalue private real estate. I mean, the highest and best use of this land under the freeway is like $2, $3 all day parking. Okay? So, except for this one building, you see there was sort of a holdout. <laughs> and, the, and the really incredible irony of this is that that building is a um, company, is a chemical company. It's like one of the most toxic, potentially toxic situations, emergency situations that can occur. It sits right in the middle of this major interchange. So this was uh, from five years ago. And the estimates at that time, $5.5 billion, 576 acres to replace the existing freeway system in a city that's not really growing, but just replacement and some expansion. I don't know if you see the tagline. And by 2020, traffic would be more jammed than ever. Okay, so here's what we do, and you know you've all lived through this, right? Freeway gets congested. So what's the, what's the solution to a congested freeway? Add a lane, okay? That's actually not the solution, but that's a solution that we have followed for so long. And the problem with it is we plan it, right? So we plan to figure out how we can expand the lane. We do an EIS. We go through all this public process, extremely painful, extremely expensive, get the decision, record decision, expand it, build it, go through about five years of expansion. The barrels today are on that side. The barrels tomorrow are going to be on that side. You survive all of that, right? And then it's done. It's open. And everyone's crossing their fingers saying, oh, I, hope, I hope people don't find out about this, right? But you really hope that all that added capacity will actually last some amount of time. But it doesn't, right? In fact, what we know today is adding lanes induces more congestion. So if you think of like 26 lane freeways in LA, they must have enough lanes there, they must not have any congestion, right? So we know that that in fact isn't true. The difference when we think about transit is that it really is an investment. I think of it more as an investment. Fundamentally, what we do when we have transit, almost every transit line that opens, if the ridership is higher than the projected count, everybody celebrates. You boast about people using the transit more than we planned. No one boasts about more cars using an expanded lane on a freeway than we planned, right? That's totally unacceptable. But what transit gives us the ability to do is actually think about it from an investment perspective rather than spending, fundamentally. And there are some other attributes of transit that I want to talk about. But I want you to always, I mean, really think about that. Because when we need more capacity on transit, what do you do? Do you add another track? No. You add another car. And if it gets very popular, you shorten the headways between, right? Do we have to invest in more track? No, we don't have to wind the system. There's a built-in efficiency of the system that can increase, that you absolutely do not have the ability to do if we build completely around the automobile. I love this drawing. It's from 1909 at a time when Milwaukee was growing. And the city was thinking about, well, how are we going to grow? Cars are going to become more common. I suppose in 1909, people understood that. But what I love about this is it is this absolute description of an understanding of civic art and the relationship of planning, landscape architecture, architecture, and a fundamental understanding of urbanism. Because what you see here, I mean, it's an enormous street section, 130 to 150 feet building face to building face, enormous. But what you see is transit in the middle with this beautiful little uh, uh, transfer station, uh, lanes for cars on both sides, generous sidewalks, beautifully planted, in such a way that this civic infrastructure is so beautiful, 
It's a street and an address that someone would want to be on. It's public money being spent in a way that drives private sector investment. That's the way we need to think about how we spend public dollars, our taxpayer dollars, is rather than throwing it away, we got to figure out how do we leverage public investment in ways that leverages even well beyond the public investment in the private realm, in the market realm, and create great places. So a little diversion into Milwaukee. Uh, an example of this, this is the Park East Freeway in Milwaukee, in the northern part of downtown, uh, that is no longer there because we took it out. And you can see what high performance of land use and development occurred after they put in this freeway, um, you know, like that, right? Uh, and when you were on the freeway, you'd never know you were crossing over this beautiful river, uh, the Milwaukee River. Um, and then you can see what, what the effect of the freeway had on, uh, on this nice old building. Um, this was taken by a student of mine uh, on a Monday morning. And you can see how necessary all those lanes, 30 feet up in the air, were to uh, making downtown Milwaukee a final place. Enormous amount of redundancy in lanes and concrete, but it was, it really was an effective barrier between a poorer uh, African-American neighborhood just to the north of downtown. That the, uh, uh, that sort of one's walk under the freeway uh, between the neighborhood, actually is a Hope Six uh, public housing development there as well, um, and the rest of downtown. The way it functioned, basically, uh, as any other freeway does, is the problem was it actually created congestion because there were only three ways on and three ways off. So everybody's hurrying up to wait, you know, and that's what happens. Fundamentally, what you want is a high volume street that has multiple ways of getting you into the grid so you don't have to go beyond your destination and circle back, right? And so as part of the downtown plan, we talked about this um, and said, well, you know, could we get a little better use out of the land uh, in downtown than this? Uh, and so we made some visions of what could happen there. And uh, people kind of like that. In fact, this was a subject of years of uh, my design studio actually looking at what could happen here. And it wasn't a class of traffic engineers, it was planners and architecture students looking at the possibilities of what could happen there. Uh, and their models and their drawings were very convincing to many of the city leaders. I think this is, in terms of synthesis, the notion of, and I know at this university you have a high degree of engagement with the community, and I think it's a very powerful relationship and important relationship uh, to maintain because, you know, um, these students made these models and drawings and um, the leaders of the community and large business leaders downtown said that makes a lot of sense. What? Yeah, well, how could it be anything else but that? And just to show you some further proof, in 1910, here's the figure ground of downtown Milwaukee and the change that occurred um, because of the automobile and demolition and how much fabric is lost. Uh, and so what this project really is about is removing this elevated freeway, providing for an opportunity for redevelopment and restoring a system of boulevards, uh, the street and block scale. And there's some kind of funny geometries going on here but fundamentally uh, focusing on the structure of the public realm, for example, the extension of the Riverwalk, um, and several new urban squares on places that were either unbuildable or um, uh, desirable from a locational perspective, uh, and, and organizing the plan around these streets and blocks and organizing it around the creation of new places. So the freeway in this image uh, is being taken down and this space, for example, is programmed to be maybe a new urban square. Um, uh, th th that pile is actually the freeway <laughs> ground up. That's kind of nice. Um, and uh, so you can see the opportunity of, of new development here and restoring the scale of the street and making new connections to the rest of downtown. So what this project does in Milwaukee and downtown, and I, and I hope you can take a tour of Milwaukee, uh, take students there. Um, give me a call, I'll try to meet you there, um, is to create a new gateway for downtown uh, and actually to improve access by removing the freeway, right? Because you actually allow people to get into the street grid much more quickly than what the freeway allowed. And it's a, it's a way of thinking about improving access and increasing opportunities for development. 
And this is what I think making cities is about. I mean, fundamentally, the public sector doesn't build cities. It's the private sector that builds cities in this country anyways, uh, and in our econ economic base. So we gotta make sure that we understand what the proper role is. Well, <laughs> this is amazing. This is before the freeway came down. I mean, this was the highest and best use of Milwaukee's riverfront <laughs> under the condition of the freeway. And if you've been to Milwaukee, you know that there are a number of really great and wonderful things happening on the riverfront uh, that are taking advantage of this amenity. Uh, new housing, new restaurants, uh, new art galleries and art installations. A lot of very interesting things are completely changing the character of downtown because we focused on the public infrastructure and the importance of making the quality uh, in the public realm. And this is an article that was, actually it's quite old now, maybe 2001 or something, but I love this byline, downtown offers an escape from suburbia. <laughs> All right. So it's a way of, again, getting back to that 1909 drawing. In this case, uh, we did this little drawing of what it's like to enter potentially into downtown. So th that, that boulevard, while it's very wide, actually is the replacement street uh, for what used to be an elevated freeway. So back to Denver. Transit-oriented development. Everybody still with me? Okay. Um, the other significant opportunity in Denver, uh, this is uh, a former um, industrial site, the Gates Rubber Factory. It's about 50 or 60 acres of land that once had thousands of people working there. Uh, and the, the company in the, in the industrial production went away. Um, and it plays a pretty critical role. It's at the confluence of I-25, a major north-south arterial, regional arterial called Broadway, um, and the confluence of the southwest line and the southeast line. <laughs> so there's a lot of action here also, in addition to the downtown Union Station. I mean, you can see ga the skate site is not that far away from downtown. That's sort of the high rises in downtown. Um, to me, the, these are some of the sort of five key opportunities of transit oriented development. As I mentioned earlier, it adds investment value. It's the difference between investment and spending. And it's a way of thinking about public investment in our transit infrastructure that's catalyzing private investment. The fixed location of stations also creates value and certainty. That's what developers love, by the way. That's what the investment market wants, is certainty. The second is the opportunity for enhancing our communities. In Denver, it's our ability to channel growth to areas of change and preserving existing areas of stability uh, and as well as connecting the benefits and enhancements of what transit has to offer. Fundamentally, what transit does is it expands our choices for our mobility. When I spoke in Germany uh, a couple years ago, um, it was very interesting because I got around Cologne and Aachen and Dusseldorf all on these very precise German trains. You know, they're never late. Um, and it was interesting because they were concerned or they were thinking about the new urbanism and is that good or bad for us? And, um, but this issue of choice really came up because we normally think in America that we are a very free country and we have a lot of choices and the automobile gives us that freedom. But in fact, if we only focus on automobiles and we don't have a richer realm and richer number of choices in terms of how we move about, we actually don't have a lot of choices. So what transit does is it actually opens up the world to a number of various housing types, uh, uses, incomes, levels of affordability, um, family structures, and those with other needs, elderly or special need populations. Um, with transit, we have a, a higher degree of efficiency in terms of location. The other thing is our transit investments allow us to create unique urban places. All the great cities that this, everyone in this room aspires to travel to or is your favorite places to go to probably have transit. And you can make such great places because the transit is available. It's a critical ingredient of making urban places. And so it creates a new opportunity for us in Denver for creating vital and memorable places. Fourth, uh, a healthy environment. I mean, it's just an efficient use of resources. There are a number of environmental uh, 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 strengths to uh, transit in terms of air quality and um, quality of life issues and decreasing our dependence on automobile and a growing population and uh, brownfield re rede <laughs> redevelopment um, as well as walkability. I mean just creating places that you can walk fundamentally is a far more healthy way to organize our cities. 
And finally, it builds transit ridership. This is the thing that we probably feel the need to impress upon our uh, transit authority more than anything. Because oftentimes, within transit authorities, they're really focused on ridership. And they want to put the parking structures closest to the station, right? Like the first thing that you should be able to see when you come out of the station platform is a parking structure. Well, well no. <laughs> no, you don't. You'd really rather have some interesting places uh, closer to the station. So one of the things that we talk about is the efficiency of transit-oriented development around the transit stations is probably the most effective way to increase ridership, to get people who live or work or shop in and around and near the station areas is the most reliable way of creating that population. So what it gives us is a new opportunity to proactively guide development versus reacting uh, to growth pressures. In Denver, we have the most number and greatest diversity of stations. And our intent here, as I mentioned earlier, is to really leverage that investment. So just looking at it on a very broad surface level, we could accommodate 69,000 new jobs, not including downtown, throughout the, the transit corridors. We could accommodate 22,000 new households in a wider range of housing choices. This only represents 41% of the job growth and 30% of the growth in households for forecast in Denver by 2030 on about 1,200 acres. So there's a lot of stuff that we can do in some very concentrated areas around transit. So what we're doing is, is developing a strategic plan for TOD. Each station isn't going to be the same. They're going to vary. Some are significant development opportunities, like downtown. Uh, some are station areas that are going into existing neighborhoods that there'll be some opportunity for redevelopment, but mostly they're just walk-in stations. So there's a whole variety of types, uh, and we're beginning to map out where the major opportunities for redevelopment are. Uh, and working on a typology, a menu, if you will, of different character and types of TOD, because some might be more employment. There'll be mixed use, but some might be more employment-centered, some might be more residential, some might be more entertainment. And so we're developing kind of this matrix and characteristics of different types that within Denver we have a full range, and we're um, extending this conversation to our many neighbors of other communities to develop kind of a again, a common menu of typologies. It doesn't mean everything's going to look the same, but it's to recognize that there are different kind of players uh, involved depending on if it's a really significant 20 acres of brand new brownfield development or it's, you know, a couple acres of a small few lots for infill. And we're beginning to map uh, what these different typologies um, might look like in different parts of the city. The third part of implementing Blueprint Denver speaks to improving our permitting processes. And this is where synthesis of multiple departments is very important. Uh, we have done a pretty comprehensive report and analysis that included staff from the mayor's office, our city attorney's office, my department, economic development, parks and recreation, public works. You can't get there unless the mayor's office is driving each of the departments to work cooperatively. Because every single department has their sub areas and divisions and specialties, and this becomes the nightmare for the developer or their consultants. So a few primary issues. We have these organizational silos that create uh, a lot of delay and consternation for our customers. We sit in a situation where there's often a big mismatch between the vision and our plans and our actual regulation. We have no citywide performance goals for how long it should take for project reviews. We do now, but these are some of the early observations. And we don't have a central way of tracking the status of a project. So it's really up to the customer to figure out where they are. So we established a few fundamental principles of reform or predictability, accountability, flexibility, efficiency, and transparency that guide a whole range of improvements. Suffice to say this, as we look at it, we look at improvements to our processes and standards to make them simpler, to get rid of as many as we can, to provide better information and apply them more consistently. But we also, and this is always the tough part in the political environment, we have to reorganize. Fundamentally, the structure of the organization is in fact the enemy <laughs> itself. I mean, we have a lot of great people who want to do a good job, but the structure and who reports to whom and 
how decisions are made is so spread out across so many different places that it's too difficult. So there needs to be a commensurate level of changes in the things that we use to review things as well as how we're organized. We also have included a, a review community to help us, comprised of many of our customers, uh, to help us. And finally, the zoning code update. What's zoning? Well, it's the law that establishes all standards for development. It controls basically three things, right? Use, density, and form. Why do we need to update the code? Well, Denver still exists. Many of the regulations still exist under this fundamental idea about cities and the fixing of cities uh, in the urban renewal period, which is clear away the old stuff and replace it uh, with this happy guy with brand new shiny tower. That's the solution to the uh, ill city. This unbelievably colorful, uh, but actually I think menacing uh, watercolor from 1964, uh, which I found in the first floor of our building, shows the beautiful Rocky Mountains, the blue sky, and this ring of freeways zooming around downtown. It also shows all these slab uh, buildings and high rise buildings replacing neighborhoods. And this was the fundamental underpinning, this was the vision so remember I talked about how sprawl is actually planned? This is the situation we're dealing with. The vision for Denver near downtown was tear away the old stuff and replace it with these shiny high rises. If anyone knows of Lodo or lower downtown, it's a, a famous place now of converted warehouse, uh, warehouses into lofts and galleries and so forth. Well, that all happens right here. And this is Union Station. So the vision for Lodo was actually to tear it out remove the whole thing and start all over. Luckily that didn't happen, but there are a number of things that are embedded into the zoning code. For example, these houses really don't conform to the zoning because of side yard setbacks. I think they're really quite nice. They make up most of Denver's great neighborhoods. Whereas this building is just fine. <laughs> or these buildings are just fine, right? The buildings in the foreground are less conforming to the zoning than the building in the background. You can imagine what that does to the folks in the neighborhood. They think they live in a single family residential neighborhood and by right a developer could build a high rise, not even ask anybody about it. So this is where we're upside down. Our regulations don't match the vision. And we, this isn't just in Denver, but every city has this problem. We have all of this special language that we use in zoning, like floor area ratio and setbacks and all these things that, you know, a little knowledge can be really dangerous. So in the hands of folks who are trying to fight a development, they learn a little bit about this stuff. But fundamentally, we miss out a few important lessons. For example, floor area ratio, you know, is a relationship between the total amount of development to the site. So a floor area ratio of four could be like this. Could be formatted like that and it's still FAR of four. It could be a 16 story building and still FAR of four. It could be 32 stories and still an FAR of four. Most people can tell the difference between a four story building and a high rise. And I'll tell you, most neighborhood folks can really tell the difference and they will tell you the difference. <laughs> so we have to go beyond these kind of reliance on pure formula. Our current code is very complicated. We have a lot of documents. In 1923, the zoning was this thick. <laughs> in 56 or 50, 55, it's actually 56 was adopted. It got a little thicker, and today our code is about that thick, but there's a whole bunch of other documents that are out there that actually I don't even know about, which should scare everybody a little bit. But it's amazing, because from the period of 1923, and this is the case in almost every American city that adopted zoning early on, there were a lot of great buildings built from the 20s to the 50s. And that's all the information you needed to know to do it. Today, you got all this other information, we're getting all this crappy stuff. So maybe there's some inverse relationship between the thickness of your zoning code and the quality of what you actually get. I don't know. But fixing the code is really important because right now it's very difficult to understand what you can do. And this unnecessary complexity adds cost, adds time, it lessens quality in the long run lost in translation. I think this is what happens. This is, a, this is the uh, Enigma machine, you know, that was used to decode. Um, and so what we really need to do is, you know, like you know mostly what to do when you see this, right? Go about 42. <laughs> but you get the idea. But you don't really know what it would, 3.14. You know, the thing is, is our zoning, zoning is the law, right? It shouldn't be mysterious. It shouldn't be misleading. 
It shouldn't be confusing, should it? And this is exactly the feeling that one often gets when you read a zoning code. We have zoning that we use a lot of words to describe three-dimensional outcomes. I was describing in earlier this morning, anyone you played with Legos when you were a child or still do? Okay. Um, you know, imagine if you had like this 10,000 piece Lego set and the only instructions you got was written. <laughs> Rather than these really elegant, beautiful diagrams, you know, that explain, you know, put this one together. And, well, that's what we do. So form-based codes are a way to begin to get to recognizing that when we talk about plans and visions, people have an idea of the character in their head. And what this allows us to do is to relate these things better in the regulations. Conventional zoning tends to emphasize the separation uses, separation of buildings. It focuses on what you can't do rather than what you can do and relies a lot on text and calculations. What form-based codes allow us to do is emphasize building form, the context, and rely on simple diagrams. So we are beginning to explore the possibilities of some application of form-based codes uh, in our overall update of, the, of, of zoning. An example of this that we've already done we did a plan for Colfax Avenue, which is a long commercial street that moves all the way through Denver, and uh, identified several places for economic development, opportunities where there are major crossings of arterials. And what we recognized fundamentally is that people think of Colfax as a main street, and they wanted to restore the sense of main street. This didn't really give them <laughs> that character of a main street, right? But um, so we talked about, well, would that help? Yeah, that helps a little bit. Could you go that dense? Yeah, that, that would still be okay. So we did a study and we said, well look, under the current B4 zoning, here's what you can do all day long, no problem. We'll just give you the permit, okay? What you can't do under B4 is you can't make these buildings. They don't meet the parking requirements, they're not located properly, the whole number of things. Now which to you looks more like a main street? This set or that set? Okay? But the regulations wouldn't allow you to do this. So it's a little bizarre. We want a Main Street, but we can't get there. If you want to get there, you have to go through the most arduous process to do it. So coupled with FAR, buildings like the one on top, you, put, you couldn't do and was very difficult to reuse. Whereas the building on the bottom, uh, it's on the left side. <laughs> um, you, you could do it all day long. Right? So we focused on the things that really were key elements of Main Street, like where do you put the building? You put it close to the street. What do you do with a building at the ground floor? You have elements that activate the street. Fenestration and transparency and entrances to ground floors and uses that animate the ground floor, as well as making sure that you recognize the transitions to the neighborhood are dealt with and that you allow a range of uses. So we have a number of sort of very simple diagrams to explain some of these transitions, depending on the context and uh, greater reliance on diagrams. This is actually an early version, but you get the idea. So there are several different types of main streets identified from the sort of smallest scale one and two story to a uh, much taller 65 foot high uh, scale. So in summary, um, when we think of planning, we need to recognize that our plans express our community vision. They describe where we want to be and they're the basis, the conceptual basis for regulation. The zoning is a legal means of implementing our plans. These regulations shouldn't be complicated. They should clearly broadcast what we want. So it's not a game of warmer, warmer, colder, colder, you know. It's really clear. Um, and that these standards and processes should recognize and facilitate our customer needs. What our customers want is predictability. They want permits more than they want development review. I can just tell you that. Um, What's important is we need to link our planning visions, what we say as a community, and we go through enormous public participation and make enormous investment and elected officials make enormous promises to the regulations that we use every single day. And we need to regulate the basics and promote a culture of design. We can't legislate good taste. We can't regulate to excellence. We need to recognize that regulations carry us so far, but we have a broader role, and that's why universities and schools of architecture have a huge opportunity to influence those outcomes. Because fundamentally what we need to do is we need to create a more discerning market. People say, I can't believe someone built that ugly building. 
And you really have to think, you know, the developer, developer's really the bad guy here. But you gotta look at it and say, well, no, see, someone is actually buying that. They were fine with it. Developers will build what they can sell. I don't think they really set out to make the world really ugly. I mean, I don't think most developers do that. They just don't know, or their buyers just don't know. Somehow we've got to elevate the conversation and the quality if we care about it. To me, the basics are building on urban strengths, design matters, and we need to focus on creating a predictable development environment. I'm going to stop right there. I have another project that I was going to show, but I think uh, we should probably stop and take questions. Is that? The biggest Marino asked him what he thinks is the biggest problem in downtown Huntington he has. Professor Brown said he's gonna tour of downtown Huntington. So what is the biggest problem? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean it's it's impossible for me to to know. I mean there's so many dynamics. It it seems to me though that Muncie has lost a lot of its fabric. I mean I, it's amazing to me how many parking lots there are in in Mon I, parking is probably never, parking is probably never a problem. It is just, <laughs> um, but I do, I did see some really beautiful signs of, of revitalization and recognition of the embodied energy and embodied quality of the historic building and existing buildings. It seemed to me that there was sort of this pattern of, you know, the, these great buildings are getting revealed again. Uh, and some nice little businesses happening there. I think what you guys should do, what I would, what I would challenge you guys to do, actually, how many students are there on this campus? Like 18,000, something like that? You should challenge yourselves and your peers in other schools and other departments to use downtown, to focus on downtown, to demand that downtown be the place for the university. I know that might be kind of a difficult thing, but I would think that most property owners and businesses in the community would kind of like that. Um, but I think that therein lies this incredible opportunity. Many cities that have this sort of college town relationship, it's, it, there's always this town and gown conflict that is sometimes uncomfortable, but generally I think for most communities very productive. Ann Arbor is a great example, Madison, Wisconsin is a great university town. Um, I think you have the opportunity to do that, but I think fundamentally it's got to be the student population. I mean, it's, you know, so the question is, as you, you know, hopefully get out of this building every once in a while and meet people who are not planners or architects or landscape architects or students. Um, socialize with others, do you do that? <laughs> um, socialize with them downtown. Find places and encourage ways of making downtown more relevant. Because that's not how it's gonna, and government isn't gonna fix that. It's the market that's gonna fix it. What, th what the city can do and the, and the school can do, I think, is to help folks in Muncie see the opportunity that's still there. I mean, I don't think it's lost. I think there's enormous potential in the play. Another question. Okay. How, the question is, how do you change people's attitudes, uh, in particularly Midwest? In Milwaukee, we, um, it's interesting. We, we did something called the Mayor's Design Awards. And um, the, the, it was a program that we did jointly with the university. And so the university would host uh, a reception. And the Mayor's Design Awards were awarded to small, primarily small business owners for um, restoring the storefront, you know, the 1920s storefront, just pulling off all the aluminum and all this crap and restoring the storefront to its former elegance. 
small stuff, a lot of small things. And it's really interesting because you start that conversation. So we had this little event, Mayor's Design Award. We gave maybe 15 to 20 awards to restaurants and bars and small retail shops that were popping up on the neighborhood commercial streets. And we're giving the awards to the owners, to the proprietors. It wasn't a design awards for architects, okay? Architects have a lot of design awards that congratulate architects for achieving excellence in design, but it's mostly architects that show up to the ceremony, right? So this was about recognizing the business owner. And I can't tell you what a great event that was because, you know, this immigrant family wanted to start a business and they just thought they were doing something that was good. And it's recognized by the certificate, a handshake and a picture with the mayor of the city at an event at the university. And a lot of these folks would never even think about going up to the university. But as a way of engaging um, and recognizing the property owner, not the architects. We, I would expect architects to care about design. Okay? But for the business owner of a little coffee shop or a little bookstore, to get an award and such recognition broadens the conversation about design and the importance of it. And, uh, and so they still do that in Milwaukee. We just did it in Denver and it's a great, so it's, a, it's one of my favorite kind of events to do. And what's interesting in Milwaukee, there was a street, really pretty rough street. We gave an award to one building for this big coffee cup that they had. Uh, and then the next year we gave it to another a bookstore, I think, and the next year we gave it to another. By the fifth year, that street had won at least, I think, four different awards. And what was wonderful about it is in the fifth year, all the businesses, whether they had won an award in the past or not, came to that ceremony, came to the event, and just cheered and just talked about the street and the revitalization of the street. And they were very proud of what they did on their own. Right? So I think part of it is just cr trying to figure out how do you keep, how do you create a conversation about design and excitement about making great cities and great communities not among the cognoscenti, not among the planners and architects, but the general community. You have to create a constituency, right? Good question, right? I saw a quick hand up. We'll take this question and then we'll have a question. How does one create the social environment for the building or the general building that is now represented? I, I think that one thing that I learned from uh, working with John Norquist is, is you rely on government as little as possible, plain and simple. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of crazy, but um, uh, I think that what I, what I talked about earlier, build on urban strengths. Don't apologize for the urban quality. I mean, when I come, I mean, I, I was last night the tour uh, that um, Dr. Kelly gave me and today's tour, th there's so much beauty in in the Midwest and in buildings and the building stock and the craftsmanship and the quality of these places. Um, and I think we gotta have that conversation and get people to recognize that. Building on strengths is the first. The second is having simple regulations. Make it easier to do the good stuff. Make it harder to do the bad stuff. And right now we're a little bit upside down on that. If there is necessity for government intervention and subsidy, be sure there's an exit strategy because if government has to continually feed, you know, it's like a drug addiction or something. I mean, if you have to continually feed this habit, it gets even more expensive and damaging over time, right? So be very clear that this is about, maybe government intervenes to instigate, to be a catalyst, but we need to make sure that before we make those commitments, there's a clear exit strategy. Like John Newton. 